What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Redacted Community Call. We have some special guests today, actually, from the Metropolis team, or as Biggie would say, the Metropolis team, formerly the, the Orca team. And you guys did a rebrand, I think, uh, several months ago now, but we'll probably talk about that at, at some point. For those that aren't familiar, uh, Metropolis is working on, I guess the best way to describe it is a new sort of governance framework for projects to adopt and we'll get into the details in a little bit so if anybody want from the team wants to give a quick intro on what kind of metropolis is and then we'll kind of dive into to the nitty-gritty after that yeah just a like quick and dirty overview so um we're building a product called pods and we kind of like to split pods into like two different ways of thinking about it first is like as a protocol so um, pods are smart contracts that wrap around uh, Gnosis safes and create this like permissions wrapper so that you have this ability to manage multi-sig signers. And um, that's like a very simple primitive, but it unlocks a lot of really cool stuff, which I'm sure we'll get into. And then the other piece um, is just the front end that actually like surfaces all of this stuff. And we have something called the Podarchy, which is basically like an organizational map. And so you can see how all of these different pods relate to one another. Um, you can see checks and balances, things like that. And so um, we kind of have the protocol side and then the the front end side. So I'm sure we'll dig into all of that today. Yeah, perfect. And, and for context for, for everybody listening, as most of you who are in this call right now know, we've been kind of discussing uh, Redacted's transition to a more decentralized uh, governance structure, especially uh, that's something we want to focus on this year. Uh, and we actually fully intend on using using Metropolis and, and the pods framework. So uh, that's kind of the the impetus behind behind bringing the team on and, and having this discussion so you guys can get a sort of deeper look into how it works. Uh, one thing I'm kind of curious about is uh, how you guys ended up on this sort of pods structure and how it is different from some of the more popular governance frameworks that that exist today. Yeah, um, I think one of the things that's really interesting about governance frameworks right now is you kind of have like two ends of a spectrum. You have like pretty centralized governance um, or you have maybe one multi-sig that might be like a five of nine where pretty much all of the permissions for a protocol is sitting. Um, you might have something similar with like a treasury. On the flip side, you have something like using Governor Bravo where you have like really decentralized way of thinking about permissions and parameter changes and protocols and even how you might deploy a treasury and our like philosophy uh behind pods is very much that there's kind of an in-between there that's probably optimal um so you know in the same way that you have risk from far too much centralization you can also have risk from having like um fully decentralized governance where actually people are not only not participating in voting but they're also not really making um smart parameter changes and things like that and so the way that we like to think about pods is this way of creating um, and distributing permissions um, where you actually have the ability to control uh, who actually has access to those permissions. So like in the example of Redacted, you might have the Pyrex pod have certain smart contract permissions. Um, and ultimately, like in an ideal world, token holders can control who sits on that pod and who has the ability to shift um, or have access to those permissions. But you might not have token holders actually controlling the permissions themselves. And so it kind of creates this um, really nice balance between decentralization where token holders have the power to um, essentially like delegate permission control and things like that, um, while also providing the efficiency and benefits that come with having a group of people who are trusted um, with being able to make certain decisions. And I think from a decentralization perspective, um, that actually ends up being a lot more effective than sort of being on one end of the spectrum or another, um, particularly when it comes to like pretty context specific, um, highly detailed um, governance decisions. Yeah, I think that makes sense because really the two frameworks that we've seen uh, or really three frameworks that we've seen are really popular is one, the multi-sig framework, which uh, is one that we use right now and one that a lot of other projects use. The other one is kind of this like delegation model that uh, Uniswap and Compound and, and a few others use. Uh, I think even Maker recently adopted it. But even that is kind of like not uh, as interesting and, and transparent because everybody, you basically aggregate power to, I don't know what the top 10 delegates and they just get to decide on on everything that goes on but i think this idea of kind of like dividing 
um, power across multiple pods so that they control different sort of silos within an ecosystem is probably a lot more effective and is a good happy medium between like everybody voting on every single proposal and just like a delegation model where 10 people are, are running everything, uh, which is something that I think is really interesting for us uh, having, you know, since we have a ton of products across a ton of different verticals, it's really nice to have like uh, different pods focused on those different verticals and different products and giving, you know, giving the community the opportunity to kind of like decide how much power those pods have and who is even potentially part of those pods, et cetera. So uh, I think that model is really interesting. Um, one question I had is kind of like, what does, um, imp it, like in a theoretical situation, what does like implementing a pod even really look like? Um, like what is something that you guys would normally suggest for teams? Uh, how should they go about setting those up? Um, yeah, and like, I, I don't know how much control should those pods have over certain things? I don't know, what are some of the frameworks that you guys think through uh, when it comes to like setting up pods for individual projects? Yeah, we really like to think about pods as permissions groups. You, When you really think about like, what are the most valuable resources that governance should be protecting and governing? Um, a lot of those ultimately come down to like protocol permissions. You also have like treasury in there as well, of course, because that's just straight up assets with value. And so the way that we like to think about um, a lot of this stuff and, and implementing pods is looking at the bigger picture and looking at like all of the different um, really high value permissions and maybe even assets that exist in an organization. And then what we like to do is kind of say, okay, how can we break these up into permissions groups that make sense? Like to your point about having individual products where people who actually have high context on those products um, are sitting on the multi-sigs that control their permissions. Like how can we, can we sort of distribute um, these permissions across different groups that, that kind of make the most sense? Um, and then from there, those individual groups are pods. The cool thing too about that is like, you know, you can set up really, really bespoke permission structures and those are really powerful. But the challenge there is that it's really, really technical. Um, often those things don't abide by uh, like a standard that's consumable by um, a lot of applications across the ecosystem. Um, and then you also just have this issue of like legibility. Like it's really hard to understand incredibly bespoke smart contract permissions. And so when you actually split them up into these groups of pods, which ultimately um, underneath every pod is a NOSA safe, um, what you actually start to create is this like standard way of thinking about um, not just how do we delegate and separate permissions, but also how do we switch individuals in and out of these permissions groups? So that's kind of how we think about it. The other element of pods that's really cool, that's like, I would say the, the primitive that makes it sort of um, like a thousand X in terms of what you can do is when we talk about like what it actually means to manage multi-sig signers, pods essentially enable this role called manager. Um, and what that does is it allows you to delegate unilateral control over multi-sig signers for an individual safe to an EOA, a smart contract, another pod, which is effectively a smart contract, a governor contract. Um, so basically you can say, okay, I want Figgy to be able to manage um, who is allowed to be a signer on this safe. And so that's like the main um, protocol feature of Metropolis. And what that actually allows you to do is say, okay, cool. I'm going to have like the Pyrex pod, for example, but I'm actually going to make it so that the, um, the like butterfly governor contract, which I don't think you guys have a governor contract yet, but um, that is actually the manager of this pod. And so token holders actually get to choose um, who is going to be on this pod and you can actually have executable votes that allow you to, to manage multi-sig signers. And so when we think about how we implement pods, you sort of have this first step of how do we break up permissions? And then the second step is how do we think about um, who sh or what entity should be a manager over a given pod? And that's where you're able to actually start unlocking like relationships between pods. And that I think is where things get really exciting because you can actually start to create um, these like permission structures where you might have token holders giving permission to um, like an emergency pod, which then manages the Pyrex pod. And so you can start to create these like um, more hierarchical structures, but of course they're still decentralized um, and still ultimately go back to um, something like a, a governor contract, which can be really powerful. Yeah, and just to be clear, like Figgy just learned how to say Metropolis like ten minutes ago, so he's not gonna <laughs> be, he's not gonna be managing any pods around here until he gets probably that figured smart out, so. for the meantime. So, and Sammy agrees with me in the chat, so I think we're all on the same page there.
Yeah, I guess like a like a question on I, I guess like when we started talking about Metropolis with with our community, <coughs> um, a, a question sort of arise, which is like been a topic that we've talked about with you guys, which is like, um, the transition to governor. And if you think that it's the right move for like a lot of DeFi projects, obviously, you know, on our end, we've decided that, you know, giving um, more control to the token is obviously the right direction for us to head in. Um, but we'd be curious to get your thoughts on, for example, um, you know, you guys being in the early stages, why you chose to work with a group like Redacted or some of the other DeFi projects that you're working with um, and, and where you see like a use case like Governor being more important, like beyond maybe the DeFi projects that you're working with. Yeah, we um, I think one of the reasons that we wanted to work with Redacted is because A, we're excited about what you guys are building. Um, but B, we're also really excited about this opportunity to explore like what does like, you know, I hate to say like governance 2.0, but like I do think that there's an opportunity for DeFi projects um, in this stage and in this era of DeFi to start playing around a lot more with uh, what governance can look like and and how you can continue innovating and creating new and interesting products um, while also having this like level of sufficient decentralization. And so that was really exciting to us. Um, more broadly, a lot of things that we're focused on from the perspective of projects that we like working with, I guess, um, Sammy, you're kind of getting at this, but like we are still in closed beta. And the reason for that is just that we want to be very intentional about the projects that we do work with and, and really creating the best design patterns possible rather than just letting everyone go at it. And so one of the main things that we optimize for is how, to, how can we think about these permissions and find organizations that have really, really important permissions that um, do have this element of um, fully decentralizing them using like a, a governor contract might not make sense from the start. And so we're really um, excited about working with organizations that are A, pushing the envelope, um, but B, also exploring this idea of like progressively decentralizing and splitting up permissions and doing this in a way that's a little bit more flexible while also getting the benefits um, that can come from decentralization when it comes to having token holders involved. And so over time, I think our philosophy is still that a lot of the pods that exist will be managed by a governor contract. So like um, ENS uses pods as well. And of course they're not a DeFi project, but the, they, the ENS governor contract is actually the manager of a lot of the pods in their ecosystem. And so from that perspective, we do kind of expect a lot of the DeFi protocols that we work with that um, are leveraging pods to ultimately have um, governor contracts that do manage individual pods. We're really excited about the idea of um, permissioning as well across not just governor contracts, but also having the ability to have individual pods that distribute permissions and are sort of delegated that authority. So we're really excited about this idea of like um, delegation of delegation in some ways too. And, and I think as you have more complex protocols and more complex permissions, that actually becomes really, really powerful and important because I think a lot of token holders don't wanna get into the nitty gritty of this stuff. One other thing yeah. that I will say that we're, oh yeah, go ahead. No, don't go for it, sorry. All good. One one other quick thing I was going to say is just that um, something else that we're really excited about when it comes to this, like, token holders not necessarily wanting to get into the nitty gritty of things is um, having, like, service providers coming in, regardless of, like, you know, opinions on different service providers. I think uh, providers like Gauntlet um, and others who are thinking about, like, risk management, things like that, we're, we're really interested to see how they can plug into these ecosystems um, as pods themselves and, and have certain um, power delegated to them. So even in like the ENS ecosystem, we're starting to see some of the stuff with the uh, recent endowment proposal and playing around with how we can have service providers plugging into these ecosystems as well, particularly for protocols that are more complex and, and require like specialists to come in from outside of the organization. 100 percent, and and that's definitely like a position we're in right i, I know uh, we talked about it for example we mentioned we are doing the treasury swap with with gmx right um and we're launching um like a collaborative project with them and i think for example like pods are like a great you know example of like maybe not a service provider but an example of how you can sort of use the governance architecture to become more collaborative with other projects um, so, like, totally agree with you there. But, you know, <clears throat> I also know the answer to this question, but I'll let you sort of answer it first, and then I'll say my side of it. Um, 
But I think for us, like maybe everyone on the stage right now, like we're all pretty aware of like what the changes would be maybe technically and organizational wise from moving from, you know, this like multi-sig structure to a more um, decentralized spread out pod structure, right? Um, but what, what does it look like for a token holder right now who's probably like who, who's locked in and redacted? Like what, what is changing for them? I mean, that's an interesting question. I guess the way that Redacted's structure is right now, um, I don't believe we integrated, actually, I know we didn't integrate um, the governor contract into Redacted's existing potarchy. I think moving forward in the future, something that we've talked about that I'm really excited about is having um, token holders actually having the ability to manage who is on certain pods. And so I think what that looks like in the long run is executable power and actually having, um, again, the benefits of this like pod based sort of um, permissions group structure while still having the ability for token holders to basically like claw back some of that control. But Sammy, I'm curious how how you see um, the, the role of token holders now that pods have been implemented and how you see that evolving in the future. Yeah, so I think right now there's <clears throat> across DeFi in general, it wasn't like this last year. Oh, last year is in 2021, um, but um, in 2022, um, it was the DeFi scene definitely changed a lot in the sense that I think um, people were scared to make proposals, right? Um, people were scared to go to the Commonwealth and, and write up a forum post and, you know, maybe take something to the DAO uh, because there was perhaps like other industry leaders that established um, <clears throat> that, that kind of established and, you know, just general commentary on Twitter and stuff established that, like, you know, the team is the one that makes the proposals, right? Um, whereas I feel like now uh, what changes with token holders is <clears throat> if they want to be passive and not participate in governance, that's obviously okay. But um, moving things on chains actually allows uh, different people to get involved in new ways that, like, basically, I'm not going to say it wasn't available before, but definitely makes it a lot easier for them now, right? Um, if someone comes along and wants to launch another NFT. We have an NFT project coming, by the way. We'll, we'll get you guys honorees. But uh, if someone wants to come along and launch like a new NFT initiative, or they want to launch um, some new initiative on another chain or something like that, um, <clears throat> it's very easy for them to come in now, maybe not even through the forum, but propose sort of this new pod that will exist in this new world that does these things specifically. They maybe want to be the leader of that pod and bring in team members, community members, external people outside the community. Um, and is able to like sort of execute that on chain much easier. So that that's kind of the way I was thinking about it for like what it looks like for like the average token holder. Yeah, totally. And I think like that is something that um, back to like the idea of standardized permissions groups and really creating like a single standard for how you think about um, these like modular pieces of an org. I think to your point, like a lot of these things just make it so much easier for people to plug into existing structures like redacted. And so I'm I'm very excited to see what that unlocks, especially when we think about like, I mean, composability is like a buzzword from, you know, forever ago at this point. But I do feel like we've done so much as an industry around composability of assets, but we haven't really thought about what it looks like to have composability in organizations. And so I think that's slowly where this is um, moving. And so I'm super excited to see how redacted plays with that. And, and uh, somebody in the somebody in the chat was kind of asking about partners you've worked with, which I, I think is uh, a little less boring or a little more boring than uh, what I'm thinking is more interesting from that. Like of the of the partners that you guys have worked with, what are some of the things that you guys maybe got like wrong about your initial thoughts of like how these would work or how they're set up? Like what are some of the lessons that you guys have picked up from some of the partners you've already sort of launched with so far? That's a great question. Um, boy, what have we gotten wrong? I think that, so for different organizations, something that we first went in several months ago thinking was like, we had this hypothesis that people who use a lot or organizations that use a lot of safes um, are like, you know, going to absolutely love pods and organizations that don't are very okay with being centralized and all this stuff. Ultimately, I think what we've realized is that there are like very specific pain points that a lot of organizations face um, across the lines of like permissions, 
uh, even like legal structure is something that pods have actually been super useful with. And so I think one of the, I don't want to say mistakes that we made early on, but things that I think we've learned along the way um, is that there are these like very specific aspects of being on chain that are just like going to be required as we move forward. Um, and a lot of that stuff doesn't really have to do with these like, I don't want to call them fluffy, but like sometimes I think when people um, think about like org design for DAOs, they're like, okay, we need a, you know, marketing Gnosis safe and we need this. And, and I think that that can work for some organizations, but I think what often tends to be much more the case is that you need to put these structures on chain, um, either because you are dealing with um, value that is on chain that needs to be appropriately distributed and um, have power that is executable around it. For example, having token holders being able to control who's multi-sig signers, um, or you need to make sure that your on-chain structure matches your like existing uh, framework that you're thinking about from like a legal perspective, which is kind of an interesting piece there. And so basically I say all that to say, I think when we first went into talking with orgs, I think we thought, yes, people will want pods for every single working group. I think the reality is much more that people actually, or organiza organizations actually need pods to think about, again, this idea of how do you have permissions uh, delegated across these different value centers within your org? And I think once we sort of shifted to that type of thinking, a lot of this stuff that we're talking about around like composability of organizations, um, having executable power structures, all of that becomes so much more clear to the point where like, you know, ideally something like an FTX can't happen again if an organization is fully on chain and you can actually see how all these entities interact with each other because that's actually where the value centers are versus having these like fluffy sort of like, um, you know, working groups that don't actually protect specific value that's on chain. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it, it's always funny with, with governance stuff because I think we spend a lot of time uh, theorizing about like how communities might engage in governance or how they might like it to be set up. And you never know for sure until you actually launch something. So I, I had a feeling that uh, things changed probably a lot um, by the time you guys like kind of started Orca and then transitioned to Metropolis and then like uh, we're theorizing about a lot of these ideas. And then by the time you actually launch it, you realize like there's some assumptions that you had that ended up just not holding up uh, whenever actual like real humans get involved, you know, and opinions start flying and people start actually voting on stuff. 100%. And I guess just to address the question too, because I guess I didn't really address the other question of like who uses pods. So um, ENS uses pods, Pleaser uses pods. Um, who else have we onboarded this past few months? Index Co-op uses pods. Um, trying to think about who we've recently onboarded. Super Rare uses pods. Julia and Dan, I'm missing a few, but um, Redacted uses pods okay. now. Yeah, I'm just gonna quickly add why we're, I mean, if, if you're done. <laughs> like, not oh no, yeah, you're good. Point. Why we thought that was um, Metropolis to stick is, um, well, I mean, not only is the team like super proactive about you know, implementing stuff that we thought would be useful, but like one of the challenges on the tech side is um, balancing centralization and, and decentralization, right? And um, sometimes you just need to be able to automate certain calls and um, those methods uh, uh, are privileged. So um, it's hard to get away from not trying to maintain sole control over certain contract functionalities, but I think it'll be really cool if Metropolis later, and I think we've discussed this, this with them, um, is the ability to retroactively apply like some form of access control um, at the at a very like granular level um, at the uh, at the function um, a contract function level. So that would be extremely valuable not only to us but like a ton of different protocols in the space, many of whom um, you know had criticisms about. Uh, you know, that aspect of their protocol um you know i'm sure many of you guys have seen like twitter threads are they're like oh yeah this is backed by an eoa or whatever um sometimes those protocols cannot you know avoid that and um, i think it'd be super cool uh metropolis once metropolis had something like this yeah we're super excited about um more granular permissions and access control um again because like that's where the value centers are in so many protocols. And ultimately like that is 
the counterparty risk of using a DeFi protocol is permissions being fucked up. <laughs> and so we're really excited about exploring yeah. how we can make sure that permissions are not fucked up. <laughs> yeah, that sounds very valuable. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. One question, uh, like something I feel like our community kind of would like to understand is, what are your opinions on kind of security benefits, right? Uh, that mm -hmm. comes from pods. I mean, it's a lot of you know, risk risk management, right? When you kind of um, you give um, only you give only like permissions to things that that uh, that that pod needs, and then you can actually like push you know higher level permissions up the stack, so it becomes like a tree of permissions, and where you can localize the the risk. Yeah, um, we are very much uh, in agreement, I think, and, and aligned on the idea that you really only need to and should only be giving permissions to um, or permissions that pods specifically need as opposed to giving these like more broad uh, permissions. And I think that is a really big element of this idea of like permissions groups. I think if you are on the more centralized side of the spectrum, which I think a lot of like the a lot of DeFi projects, particularly ones that um have been created in the last couple of years are you're often sort of aggregating a lot of permissions into one or two safes and so i think from the perspective of localizing the permissions which i love that term never um i think the the concept here is very much only give the permissions that that these pods absolutely need and then i think the the other interesting aspect here that we think a lot about is like over time, there's also something interesting to be said for like passing off those permissions um, once they are stable and, and if it feels right to like a governor contract. And, and so I think from that perspective, um, we're really excited about the idea of like evolutionary permissions and, and thinking about permissions as not the static thing, but, but something that can shift and change over time. Um, but from the perspective of uh, this idea of like trees of permissions, that's definitely uh, how we think about this stuff. And, and I think the the cool thing too, is that like you, you can localize these permissions when you, when you give token holders or other authorities, the ability to change who is on a multi-sig, because what you basically have is like a backup plan for, you know, if there is a bad actor or, or whatever it might be, um, an ability to not just change the permission access itself, but actually just change who's on the multi-sig. And so we kind of think about it as like a two-tiered system for how you can think about um, securing permissions and making sure that you have this balance, again, that KP was talking about between decentralization and also efficiency and, and being able to, to actually get shit done. So I think we are now at the 30-ish minute mark. If anybody has any questions they want to squeeze in before we wrap this up, feel free to ask them now. I'll wait a second. And if not, um, Chase, Dan, Jules, I appreciate all three of you coming in and educating the community a little bit. Are there any, are there any resources that you guys can recommend for those who want to get sort of caught up on, on Metropolis or understand pods a little bit better? any podcast, blog post, whatever uh, that you guys can recommend to, to anybody listening right now? Yes. Um, I sent the, I guess for redacted specific stuff, I sent the redacted podarchy. So um, this is actually the current implementation of pods for redacted, which you can play around with. Um, also, Figgy, on, on your stuff around some of the more granular permissions, um, what can be changed or fixed kind of depends on the permissions themselves. So a lot of that stuff is like outside of pods, but um, I do want to share a little bit of alpha, which is that in, I think a month or two, we're shipping um, on the Potterkey a new lens. So if you go to the Potterkey, we have like the financial lens and the membership men lens, which basically just adds data to um, the Potterkey we're shipping a permissions lens. So actually you'll be able to see which permissions have been delegated to individual pods. So you'll be able to see like which permissions does the Pyrex pod hold. Um, and so from that perspective, not only are you able to understand what's going on, but you can get really, really granular with specific pods. Um, you can also, if you wanna learn more about pods more broadly, I just sent our docs, which has sort of an overview of, of pods, generally how they work. Um, and I think we're also going to be 
hopefully writing up a piece soon on how Redacted uses pods more specifically. So hopefully that will uh, paint a little bit more of a picture as well. Awesome. Sick. Well, I appreciate all three of you stopping by and coming to hang out for a little bit. Uh, we'll, we'll transition to some of the Redacted stuff now, uh, some of the ecosystem updates we have. So you can stay on stage. You could drop off. Uh, totally up to you guys uh, what you want to do. But yeah, I appreciate all three of you stopping by and, and taking the time. Thank you, Colton. I also just really appreciate the questions that everyone asked. Those were very interesting questions. Um, so thank you all for being thoughtful, as always. Yeah, yeah this was super fun. Thanks if for having enough, us. If you get enough of us in a room at one time, we seem a little bit smart sometimes. So <laughs> that's how it works. And we have a new way of saying our names. So that's like yeah, you, you learn. Ideal. You guys learn something new. We learn something new. Thanks, it's like Spiggy. a fair trade. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thanks so much for having us, guys. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate Thank it, guys. guys. Have a good weekend. All right, cool. So now we can move on to some of the redacted updates. So uh, again, if really quickly, if you guys want to learn anything about Metropolis, go check them out. Um, Chase dropped some links in the town hall text chat if you want to dig through those and get a better understanding of how they work and how we how we may be using them. Uh, uh, Maybe not soonish, but at some point this year, I think we definitely want to make big strides towards uh, transitioning to to a pods based governance structure. So, redacted stuff. Some updates really quickly. Uh, first of all, if you haven't already, go buy some merch. There's still a little bit left. There's some units left. Uh, you guys uh, did. I, I think a lot of people actually ended up getting their hands on a shirt, and some have already received deliveries. So shipping seems pretty quick. Um, so if you haven't gotten one, go get one. Uh, the link is somewhere in the announcements channel. Maybe figure or somebody can drop it in the town hall text chat for those of you who haven't gotten one yet. Um, so if you, if you guys want to get one, go get one. Uh, there's some still available. And then for, oh wait, that's actually all the, the sort of general updates. So I guess, uh, one thing we can kind of move on to is the, uh, policy side with funky and bonds um, if you kind of want to talk about uh, some of the bonds changes we've announced recently right. <laughs> Did I talk again what? oh no that's horrible uh, it's like very quiet or you're far away or something like that so yeah that's that's the worst it's ever been <laughs> yeah i've never heard it that bad but uh, while we're so I am, I'm out and about. If, if I can't do it, then I just never can do it. Uh, yeah, never. You go ahead and do it. I think your mic yeah. is a little better. <clears throat> cool. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we launched two rounds of bonds. Uh, first one being the ETH bonds, couple, like in January 4th. Those, may, those uh, we started off with like a pretty low capacity of like around 50k USD worth of uh, butterfly that was finished and then recently after that around a week ago we launched both weth and um and ucc bonds around 900 butterfly worth uh we've been paying around uh seven percent or so discount which is pr pretty good for over a five day uh linear vest so those have been going well as you know or uh, price of butterfly has been somewhat stable past in the past month or so so it's kind of, uh, yeah, we didn't want to oversaturate the market with kind of super added on sell pressure, but also wanted to capitalize on the good price action that we've been seeing lately. So managing that has been fine, not overly high discounts. And recently we also launched OTC bonds where, you know, for market participants that want to enter, you know, butterfly positions, but it's find it difficult to enter through the LP pools and slippage would be way too high, I think, you know. Price uh, with sizes of above 100k. So we have recently gotten some interest through that too, and looking to finalize those. So if anybody has questions about those, just drop them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I think they're pretty straightforward. So if you're out of the loop on the OTC bonds, we actually have an OTC bonds channel where Funky dropped a message, sort of explaining the background, uh, gave an example of like OTC terms, etc. So. You can kind of get a feel for how those work and why we launched them, what some of the benefits would be, et cetera. So that is, again, it's in the OTC bonds channel for anybody who 
I was kind of curious about that. And for those of you completely out of the loop on bonds, they are live on the bond protocol app. Um, I don't know the actual link off the top of my head, but if you're looking to tap into the bonds, just go to the bond protocol application and you can use and find them there. Um, hidden hand stuff. Uh, as far as metrics go, hidden hand is just like chugging along as normal. Uh, same update as we've given in all of the previous community calls. I think uh, Bit19 is going uh, pretty much the same as it has been for the past several weeks. So all of that is good. Balance for ecosystem still growing, but we do have a kind of big hidden hand update coming uh, relatively soon. I guess never. You could probably uh, touch on that as well. Um, basically, we are introducing a pretty big quality of life improvement to hidden hand, but I'll let never kind of explain the, the details of that. Yeah, so we would have uh, now an intermediary contract that kind of handles the state of state updates on the tokens and have ability to basically run kind of the operations uh, of hidden hand on, on chain, uh, the on-chain side. So what this allows is <clears throat> that now this auth contract will have permissions, keys will be uh, stored and sa safely stored on Open Zeppelin. And now we kind of have future parity with Odium, uh, which means that, you know, instead of having to wait for a larger multisig, uh, which takes, you know, human coordination to get it through, now it'll, the sole responsibility of kind of running the, the operations will be automated and it shall lead to a much better user experience for DAOs and users who want to, you know, see like instant liquidity from their from their votes, uh, which should uh, basically make everything more efficient. Right now, there's no real loss of time value of money when people are making bribes, since uh, coordinating this thing take, takes a bit of time. Sheesh, he broke out the time value of money. That's how you know this is uh, serious. Never is breaking out his economics terms. But basically, yeah, wh whenever that goes live, we will be uh, pushing an announcement, stuff like that. And this has been kind of one of the biggest pain points for Hidden Hand. So um, maybe, you know, after we make that announcement, everybody kind of like do your best to amplify the message because it could be the case that there are users out there who have um, delayed using Hidden Hand because they were worried about, um, you know, the time between uh, bribes and actually receiving those those bribes. So uh, make sure that you help amplify that message as much as possible so that uh, we can maybe introduce some some new users to the hidden hand ecosystem and, and make them get involved. So uh, that's a pretty exciting update. Shout out to the devs for, for working on that and getting that knocked out. So we'll be launching it uh, relatively soon. Hopefully, I don't know what the timeline looks like for that never, or if you just said it, I might've missed it. Uh, looking to deploy today oh, and uh, test it out over the weekend and then production next week. Cool, yeah, so we'll, uh, yeah, we hopefully deploy today and we'll do the announcement kind of uh, early next week. So be on the lookout for for that. Um, moving along, let's go to Pyrex because I think, you know what, I think we can kind of leak uh, what the Pyrex GMX timeline is as well. So uh, KP, I'll, yeah, let, I'll, let you, I'll let you give the generalized update and then we'll go from there. That's too before I got censored. That's what we do around here. Like not my jokes no more. Okay. Um. All right. Yeah. That's very cool. Uh. But yeah, for Pyrex GMX. Um. Yeah. I think. Man. I mean, yeah. I think last community call already said that we finished our. Uh, the changes that we needed to after the C4 audit. Um. And uh, we recently just got the green light from Verilog, who has been auditing the audit changes. Um. Ever since we started making them and. Uh, I mean, there's there's still one minor change in pipeline that they're now auditing again, um, but yeah, other than, I mean, for the most part, we're pretty much yeah already done on the contracts. I mean, everything looks like great. I, I do think we're gonna see a repeat of um, like Pyrex Convex, and how uh, you know just by offering like the best possible uh, product, we were able to go from you know zero to a hero, right, God. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I, I do think like that's just how we operate as a team. Like we'll always do our best to put out the best possible product. Um, but yeah, yeah, as Colton mentioned, we do have a fixed time, like a date, uh, which is January 31st. And uh, we're going to be launching Arbitrum first and then helping users with the product and just making sure everything goes smoothly there um, before deploying an Avalanche. 
Sick. Yeah, and and so just to repeat what what he just said. So January thirty one is our uh, our target launch date for Pyrex GMX. And for those of you who are GMX or GLP holders, you will be able to deposit into Pyrex GMX and take take full advantage. So uh, maybe we can pause here for a second, just in case anybody has questions about Pyrex GMX. If not, then um, yeah, we can move on to anything else. But I'll wait a second for Pyrex GMX stuff. But essentially, again, going live Jan 31, that's the target. If if it ends up getting delayed in any way, we'll let you know. But ideally not. Uh, we think we, we feel pretty strongly about the timeline, which is why we're, we're saying it. Yeah, so going first live, uh, going first, oh my god, I can't talk. Going live on Arbitrum first on the 31st. And then AVAX will lag uh, kind of shortly after that. So I, I think KP wants to wait and see if uh, everything just goes smoothly on on Arbitrum and then expand to Avalanche. Is that is that right, KP? Yep. Great. So yeah, we just want to make sure everything goes like well. Um, but just to, I guess, let everyone know things that have happened to other. Uh, protocols that offer GMX derivatives, um, like they're not going to happen to us. And um, it's because we always try to keep uh, like our protocols um, as close to the actual, um, you know, surface we're building on as possible without any, uh, you know, I, I think like third party potentially manipulatable. Does that work? Okay, M M manipulatable. I think I need your help. Uh, yeah, manipulatable. Uh, yeah, sources of data. So um, I think that's one major uh, benefit that we have, uh, which makes other pro which should make other protocols. Um, well, we we soak in other pro protocols and uh, who will be integrating us into their products and increasing the yield of our users. So like, um, Loso just asked, does using us lock up your like if you were to deposit your GMX, it would be locked forever. And uh, the the answer is yes. But not only will we pro provide liquidity so that you could you know, still sell your, technically sell your GMX if you wanted to. Um, our ability, I mean, once we integrate with partners, your yield should be whatever you would receive from staking GMX and the yield from our partners, right? So that increases your yield even further than if you were to stake with GMX. Sick. So yeah, again. So it's uh, like double, not double, sorry. Not, not, I'm talk, not talking about the number, but double the benefit. Yeah, so... Um... Yes, Loso asks, does that make me lock GMX forever? Yes, but again, there's liquidity, so, so you can exit. Uh, Damien asks, has the treasury swap happened? No, not yet. I think the last I remember, the plan is to kind of do it next week. Um, next week, yeah. Yeah, so next week, the, the swap is going to happen. Uh, Okay, I guess we can, if that's all the Pyrex GMX questions, then we can kind of tackle some of these general questions. Uh, I'll wait one more second for GMX, but I think we're good. So, uh, Joker Frog asks, any updates on our partnership with DAMM? Is it going well? Did we receive any of their tokens for participating with their product? Is anybody up here closer to that conversation? I don't know, Sammy, if you have any insights there or not. <clears throat> uh, I can't see the question. It's the one Joker Frog asked. So, any updates on our partnership with DAMM? Is it going well? Uh, Did we receive any of their tokens for participating with their product? Um, no. The 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 DAM partnership, you know, <clears throat> we're still like trying to figure out how to scale the butterfly into the vault. Um, some of the things that were sort of like promised, uh, um, weren't delivered. Right, um, which means that you know it doesn't necessarily require us to deposit right away, um, but we still talk to them a lot. Uh, they are building some cool stuff, but I think you know for the time being, like there's definitely other priorities which we're focused on, um, and we're happy to sort of sit on the sidelines and wait for them to like you know deliver on um, some of the things that they guaranteed us. For example, um, market makers and you know the, the the core premise of their DAP. But I hope that sort of answers it. Yeah, I think that should. Joker, does that answer your, answer your question? Yeah, cool. Uh, Gangster123456 
is asking what do we spend most of our time on right now um i don't know i i don't i don't think we spend the majority of our time on any one particular thing uh, i think like there is a pretty even split across like hidden and quality of life improvements getting pyrex gmx out and working on new pyrex stuff and then also of course working on working on dinero and i think the way that we sort of uh tend to operate is that we'll like sprint on a particular thing as it gets closer to completion right so for example like if you ask what we're spending our time on right this second it's like getting pyrex gmx out the door but if you ask us for if you ask us that same question a month from now it'd, it'd probably be different based on whatever is getting released so hopefully that answers that uh, any updates on the De Niro white paper release timeline product updates? All right, uh, <laughs> guys. So uh, I know there's going to be like a lot of De Niro like white paper timeline stuff like that. The De Niro white paper is probably like a long way off, especially the completed white paper. Um, perhaps we'll release like a a shorter, uh, less detailed white paper uh, between now and then. But there are a lot of steps to actually getting De Niro to be complete, and there's kind of uh, a handful of unknowns that we have to address internally before we can like solidify that on a white paper right so like the the idea behind a white paper is that it's complete it's uh sound uh functionally everything is accurate and makes sense etc so there's all these different things we have to account for uh before we could like put a put a white paper out there but um i would say we are now more clear internally on the direction we want to go to actually get De Niro, uh sort of completed or uh, in what phases we'll sort of complete it in. So uh, right now we're starting to get a lot of the groundwork laid for, I guess, phase one of what will ultimately become De Niro. So hopefully that helps. But yeah, it's just, it's hard to give like a lot of detailed answers right now because we're still working through a lot of the details ourselves, And I don't want to put anything out there that uh, ends up not being true a month or two from now and confuses people who kind of only get fragmented information. So sorry if that didn't answer the question sufficiently, but yeah. Um, is there any specific decks you are going to target for PX GMX and PX GLP liquidity? Never this might be a question for you or funky if you're back at your desk. This is um, we're talking with Camelot really deeply. Um, we're trying to get onto the Camelot round table or Knights Council, as they call it, on Arbitrum um, and get some extra rewards there because, as you guys know, we're trying not to put butterfly rewards behind it. Um, <clears throat> so um, one of our partners on Arbitrum being um, that new DEX, Camelot, uh, is really excited about um, some of the developments with Pyrex. Uh, we've, we've given them some sort of idea of things after gmx and glp and i think they're you know really excited about all of it so at the in the current moment it, it looks like camelot is the home for the gmx and glp liquidity dope with, with additional grail incentives for lps dope so I think we are all cut up. Yeah, we just like harassing me about the narrow. Yeah, I mean, I guess you can, uh, you can keep, you can keep harassing me about it because eventually I'll give you an answer, right? Like that's how it usually goes. So I tell you nothing, I lead you on for months, and I gaslight you, and then eventually I give you what you want, and then you fall in love with me again. So it's like one of these things. Um, why Camelot? Loso asks. Um, yeah, I, I wrote the response. I said good incentives compared to the rest of the dance, the dex landscape there. But um, I think if there's other suggestions, like we'd be happy to hear them, right? Um, so PXGMX will be there. Yeah. Um, if like you know, if you guys prefer other dexes there, we'd be happy to do it. Obviously, the Dopex dex, like that's not coming out for a long time. Um, sushi, I think while we like sushi, like there's no reason why we would do it on sushi at the moment um the spare uh, spare is an interesting one the demeter um maybe i see karn is on the stage like i'll maybe let karn um talk in the in the channel about like what we're doing with with spare and 
how that's related to Plutus and stuff. But I think in terms of like, you know, um, I think in terms of like trying to pull in the most liquidity for GMX, um, Camelot has offered us the best proposal. But yeah, Losa, like, you know, we have talked to all of these, all of these guys. Yeah, uh, maybe just to speak more about the uh, Spherex one. So currently, they have matching incentive programs up to, um, I believe, 10,000 USD notional per month. So like if we have a pool that we want to sponsor with $10,000 worth of emissions of some sort or incentives of any token, um, they will match it with uh, SPA tokens uh, calculated through some, um, I think, uh, weekly TWAP or something. Um, and the thing there is, um, if we're going to have very large pools, um, these type of incentives, like they don't add up to a huge amount, right? If you look at the current protocols that are doing this, they have quite small pools relative to the size of the incentives they're getting. That's why they have really good APYs. Um, so we're going to be very careful about how we're going to um, allocate any of the treasury's money, right? We want to put it towards a purpose that matters. Um, and it's possible that uh, if it makes sense to have something paired with a stable coin and we want to heavily incentivize it, like SphereX will be top of our minds. But for example, like for um, EXGMX, right? Like more likely people would want liquidity against ETH or something else with it. Um, and also, there is a very manual process right now to get into the Demeter program. Um, you do have to make DAO proposals on both sides. Um, there's some work that has to go into deploying some contracts. Um, the Spirax team is going to automate this process, sort of like the um, weekly bribe cycles or bi-weekly you see across the various uh, BE tokens. So, uh, you know, like that would simplify life <laughs> uh, once they get to that stage. But yeah, that's sort of like how the current things are and how we're thinking about it. So, Nick's Karn and Joker Frog asked uh, any discussion around the Jones DAO proposal. So he's talking about the um, the recent uh, strategic treasury alignment on GJUS. I haven't even read the proposal, um, but that's the one I just posted in the chat. So anybody curious, you can go to the Commonwealth Forum and, and find that. Uh, I haven't read it, so I don't have a comment on it, but uh, if anybody up here has a comment on it, feel free to to give it, I guess. I'd say it's um it's really up to everyone here. I've, I've heard different opinions on it. Um, what I will say is that, like, you know, um, <clears throat> the Treasury stays... Um, very risk on compared to like the rest of the market um we stay very risk on um considering like the amount of cvx we hold and then you know we decided with aura that we're going to hold the aura and not sell it all this sort of stuff um and i think like the stable coin balance that we do keep for operations and audits and all this sort of stuff that keep the lights on um <clears throat> you know it, it doesn't make sense to like also go risk on with that um uh, i'm pretty unopinionated on the proposal uh, i'll just say like i don't mind doing either it's worthwhile noting that we do control like around one percent of the drone supply um as a DAO. um <clears throat> so obviously we want our partners to succeed and make sure their products are doing well and stuff like that but i don't know if this is the right um place to park the stables at least at the moment compared to you know something a bit more conservative like an rv or uh, a compound which is just like you know proven and safe and you know less yield but obviously um as, as people learn over time like the higher the yield the, the higher the risk right so cool so hopefully contract risk um it, you know the thing is also here can like um <clears throat> these pro these protocols that try to go double digit apy on usdc um it's not a simple lending borrowing strategy. It often involves complex things like option writing or trading gamma, trading delta, all these different, you know, very complex uh, trading strategies, right? Trading, not passive uh, key thing, right? So 
um, yeah, the, the, I'll sort of leave it at that. But, you know, I think it's going to do really good, and I just, I just don't know if it's the right place for our treasure. Cool. Yeah, yeah and I would want to add, like, one, I guess, like, small thought about it. Like, if you look at um, asset, alloc asset allocation and treasury management more in, like, the TradFi world, um, they would want to see, you know, multi-year track records before they put something in right like any portfolio or hedge fund that has like less than a five-year uh track record is like non-statistical and like 10 years it's where um people start to look for um meaningful trends right because the noise is well it's very noisy um compared to the amount of signal you have and like, i know in DeFi we move uh, probably 20 times faster so you know like i personally would rather us caution that um for our partners like we're always happy to support them and we just want to see enough data to make sure that everything is working properly um and you know like uh everyone and their grandma is making some levered farming on um glp and some to more success than others and um yeah like you don't know how these things go because everyone's doing back testing, everyone's running on test net. Um, but during actual deployment, you encounter a lot of like various situations that you couldn't have predicted. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, and also like one of the things that um I guess we're talking to people about is sort of separating out how much risk and reward you're taking, right? So like um something I'm personally very excited about is like you know different ways we can tranche out the risk and yield of these so you know if it ever comes to the point where we can take the more senior tranches or like the more risk protected tranches for a uh, yield that's more attractive than something like Aave but still you know very low risk like that's um I think something that we could uh yeah yeah um, use to uh more advantage in our treasury, right? Because we don't want something to go bad, collapse, um, and drain our runway. Yeah. Because right now we're in a pretty decent place and we don't want to take too much risk to try to squeeze out an extra, you know, 5% APY. Those are my thoughts. Yeah, right. So hopefully that answers <laughs> everybody's, everybody's concerns and gives them enough insight to uh, provide their own feedback on the proposal. So you have ideas? Um, then hop in there and, and let us know. There's a comment section for a reason on those. So cool. Uh, I think we made it made it past the hour. Uh, I don't want to drag this on. It's Friday after all, and people um, people love me, but I can't give them too much of me or uh, they'll start to get used to me and won't love me anymore. So uh, if anybody has any further questions, people just ask them in the general chat or whatever will be around, and I will... Uh, I will get this uploaded probably on Monday. I think the new upload schedule we're going to do is uh, Friday call and then Monday upload because it kind of rewards the people who are here first, right? Like I want there to be a little bit of delay. So everybody who hangs out here, you get the alpha a couple of days early than, than everybody else um, because I'm just an evil person like that. But yeah, I'll get this uploaded Monday. Everybody have a good Friday, good weekend. Thanks for Wait. hanging out. Oh shit, here we go. I don't have a joke, joke but I do have a question for the community because then they're always asking us questions. So it's about time we turn the tape, you know. All right. Do you remember when you were in Canon you used to blow bubbles? Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's a man. That, that wasn't the. That, that isn't even. Okay, you don't. All right, well. Just, all right, I'm just going to pretend that you, you said yes. Right, I'm fucking done. I'm... <laughs> what the fuck was that? Look at that. This is. <laughs> oh my god! Worst. All right. Was, well, um, I hope that I hope everybody can still enjoy their Friday after that and their weekend. Um, yeah. Th thanks for hanging out. We'll get it uploaded Monday. Uh, peace out, everybody. Peace. Peace.